I wasn't sure if I was ever going to actually end up making this video. I started recording footage for it two years ago, but then stopped because I thought it may have already been too late. But then I realized there are new people playing this game all the time, and not making a video like this would be a mistake. So this one's for you. I'm going to keep this as spoiler free as possible. Yeah, I'm going to show footage from the first three biomes of the game, but no further than that. And anything that qualifies as a secret is not going to be shown. Although I am going to lightly hint at a few things. If you don't know who I am, I've got a lot of experience with this game. I've been playing it since the very, very beginning and making in-depth guides on it. And I've been known to do a speedrun or two. Anyway, in this video, I'm going to discuss the basics of the basics, what I consider to be the best tips for new players. And we're going to begin conveniently with this little one right here. You can actually right click flasks in your top inventory bar in order to drink them. All you got to do is go into the input tab of your options menu. And then this one right here, click on icon switches item and make sure that that is set to on. And then you'll be able to quickly and conveniently take a sip out of that potion in order to move faster, levitate higher, get a mana buff, do more damage, etc when you might need it the most. Just keep in mind that not all potions can be drunk. Some must be applied externally as a stain. I'll leave it up to you guys to discover that for yourselves. Speaking of potions, one of the most important items in the entire game is this item right here. The water potion, or water flask. Because as anyone who's played this game for longer than a few minutes can tell you, we are entering a very dangerous environment. And because healing options are very limited, every single point of health is important. Continuously spraying yourself down with water will help to ensure that you do not burn to a crisp in the presence of fire. Water will also help you access areas that are choked full of toxic sludge by actually quickly diluting it and making the area safe to wade through. Water can also be used to quickly wash off any other possibly detrimental stains, such as that from Flamuxium. Some enemies might even be allergic to water. And it can be used during your explorations to access other areas. Something that I like to do is to be able to quickly switch between my main attack wand and the water flask. I bind select item in slot 1 to R and select item in slot 5 to Q because I'm very used to using the Q and R keys in other games. With these binds, I can quickly switch to the water flask to spray myself down or remove a stain and then switch immediately back to my main attack wand. So yes, in slot 1, I always have my main attack wand and in slot 5, I always have my water flask early on when I need it. But whatever is more comfortable for you, that's the most important bit. And yes, there are other liquids like blood that you can use to wash off stains, but none are as universally useful as water. It is the universal solvent after all. If you eventually obtain a form of fire immunity, then water loses one of its uses, but it still retains others. Anyway, any experienced player of this game can tell you that yes, water flasks are one of the most useful items in the entire game. Make sure you use it. And if you don't start with one, either empty the liquid that you do start with, or preferably find another flask as soon as possible and fill that one with water. And now, on the subject of stains, there are a lot of these in Noita. Each one, like water, has a different result. They are essentially this game's take on status effects. Even things such as fire have a stain, and information about each one, as it affects you, can be obtained by the indicators beneath the health, levitation, and mana gauges on the right side of the screen. Like status effects in other games, not all stains are bad, of course. Some, like oil, are semi-neutral, and others, like those from magical liquids or even blood, are really good. Understanding stains and how they all work is paramount in your survival in this game. So pay attention to those status effects and learn what they all mean. As a tip, if you have a stain that you really want to get rid of but you don't have a good way to wash it off, fire will actually make stains drop much faster than normal, which is obviously even better if you have the aforementioned fire immunity. But even without the fire immunity, this can save you some HP. Just make sure that you get out of the fire before you get set on fire. During your adventures through the absolutely massive world of Noita, you will encounter many different types of potions. Do not shy away from using these, some of them can mean the difference between life and death. 
This is why the mines biome usually has a good number of magical liquids inside. It's the first and easiest of the biomes and makes a perfect sandbox in your experiments in discovering what each of these potions can do, such as Invisibilium's ability to allow you to completely avoid combat in order to freely explore as long as you can remain unstained by anything else, Pheromone's ability for you to turn enemies into allies, and Ambrosia's ability for you to negate literally any type of damage, whether that be enemy attacks, fire, or even this. Just keep in mind that in order for Ambrosia to block incoming damage, it must remain as a stain on you. So I don't really recommend using it in liquids, but if you need to do it, it can be done if you're fast. Some of the materials you'll find in flasks have more than one use. So again, experiment because alchemy is all around us. If you're careful and you find one of these enemies right here, you can actually use them to farm some of these potions for you. Most of the potions this guy will throw are of the deadly variety, but you can use those against enemies and you can also get pheromone, berserkium, and teleportatium from these guys. And importantly, their flasks are special and actually hold a little bit more than the normal flasks. Before we get to part two, here's another tip. The primary starter wand is not the greatest, to put it lightly. If you find yourself in the first holy mountain and you're still using this as your weapon, you might consider putting one of the spells from it onto your secondary or bomb wand, as that wand fires faster, although it has low mana. If you happen to find a flask of concentrated mana, which is not too uncommon in the mines, you can drink some of that or stain yourself with it, and as long as the buff lasts, you won't have to ever stop shooting. Although, I do not recommend relying on this for longer than the first couple biomes. Anyway, now let's get on with part two. Like I said earlier, the water flask is one of the greatest inventory items in the entire game, but this next item is probably the greatest. There are 13 of these scattered around the world, but the easiest to find one is right here, next to the lava lake. The Emerald Tablet. Not only are they a good source of lore and potential secret hints, but they also happen to be an incredibly useful weapon. That's right, just drop one on an enemy and it will do an impressive amount of damage. What's even more interesting is that if you're invisible, dropping a tablet and killing an enemy with it does not break your invisibility, as long as you don't get stained by that enemy's blood, or get hit by a blind counterattack. If you're good at keeping invisibility, then you could literally travel around an entire biome and empty it out of all enemies, killing them stealthily like some kind of ninja philosopher. There is also an advanced technique called tablet kicking that allows you to do far more damage. It does take some practice to get the timing right, but you basically kick and then throw the tablet at the perfect time for your kick to connect and send the tablet soaring into your enemies. There is another advanced technique called tablet digging, which allows you to use a tablet to dig through literally anything with enough practice. I have a video just on this, so if you want to learn the ins and outs of it, you can check that one out. I'm including it here to give you an idea about just how diverse the uses of tablets are, which does also include tablet surfing. Dropping a tablet very gently underneath you by keeping your cursor very close to your feet allows you to actually land on it mid-air, which replenishes some of your levitation energy, allowing you to, with practice again, levitate infinitely, or just much, much higher than you normally would be able to. But setting any of those advanced techniques aside, tablets still are a very good weapon. If you find yourself in the third biome and beyond without a wand that does suitable damage against the much more armored mechanical enemies, you could just drop a tablet on them and do a ton of damage. So yes, I do recommend you carry a tablet with you at all times throughout at least the beginning of your run. It is without a doubt the most diverse and useful item in the entire game. And now we're going to discuss the art of dodging. How to read enemy attack patterns and then avoid that incoming damage, which typically involves levitating above the attack or falling below the attack. And again, the variety of enemies inside the mines are the perfect opponents to practice this on. I actually do recommend just standing in front of an enemy in the mines and practicing dodging. The shotgunners are especially good to practice this on because as soon as you hear the sound of them cocking the shotgun, 
you know that that is your signal to start dodging. If you're too close to the enemy, then you'll probably still get hit. So it's all a matter of learning distancing and kind of the angle at which you need to levitate out of the way in order to avoid all of the projectile. Similarly, these guys, the toxic sleazebags, fire a fairly slow moving projectile at you and it can definitely be worth your while to just practice dodging them. Of course, their attack also leaves toxic sludge all over the place, so again, carry that water flask to clean up their mess. When you reach the third biome, the Snipe Buhisi enemy is one of the enemies that a lot of people have trouble with, but again, with a little bit of practice, you'll know how to dodge them. They also give you a nice bright red laser to let you know that they're currently aiming at you. Now, don't get me wrong, these guys are still capable of trolling even the best player, because as with any enemy in this game, they are a bunch of aimbotting cheaters. And then we get to the dreaded Uko, which fires a slow-moving, easily dodgeable, but expensive explosive electrical attack. If this directly hits you early on, you'll probably die. However, don't be afraid of them. They are pushovers, trust me. Just make sure when you're dodging them that you're not too close to any walls or solids, because then as you dodge the projectile, it will explode on the wall behind you and still stun you with electricity, leaving you wide open for a follow-up attack. Hilariously, this enemy's attacks also do self-damage, i.e. it will happily blow itself up trying to hit you if you happen to beat its attacks correctly. But again, practice, practice, practice. As you play, observe enemy attack patterns, and then over time, learn how to dodge them. Anyway, that brings us to the next part. So I've already talked about materials and status effects and flasks and tablets and dodging, and now it's time to use that knowledge to do what you should be spending a lot of time doing in this game, and that is exploration. It is very, very important for you to take your time, pace yourself, and fully explore the biomes you find yourself in. Of course, because Noita is a difficult game in a very dangerous environment, you can quite easily be pushed into progressing a lot faster than you should if you're not careful. So in this way, Noita should really be looked at as a hardcore survival game where every single point of damage matters, especially early on in the first three biomes. Why not the fourth biome and beyond? Well, I'm not going to show it because I don't want to spoil it, but the dynamic changes a little bit in the fourth biome when a certain enemy is introduced. The only thing more I'll say is pay attention to what every enemy is doing in that fourth biome. Anyway, one of the most important reasons for why you would want to explore is to increase the size of your maximum health pool, because obviously in video games that have health, you want to keep that number as far away from zero as possible. However, talking about stains again real fast, keep in mind that any stain that does damage over time, such as fire, toxic sludge, and poison, will do more damage over time the more max HP you have. Therefore, your water flask becomes far more important in removing those stains if you don't already have immunity to those substances. Other than health, you will find wands, you will find spells, you will find flasks and items, and you will find gold. Yes, gold is useful, it allows you to buy spells and wands, and it allows you to reroll perks in Holy Mountains, but a very useful lesson to know is because the environment is very dangerous, don't go chasing gold into the unknown. If you kill an enemy and some gold nuggets fall into a dangerous area, you don't need those. It's okay, you need your health more. There are actually many different ways to acquire gold in this game. Some obvious, such as killing enemies, some a little bit less obvious, such as mining the veins of gold ore you'll find in some areas, and some secret. You'll also find a significant amount of gold in chests during your runs. But again, I want to stress that if acquiring the gold means that you'll take a bunch of damage or possibly even die, it is not worth it. But if you are careful and you acquire a lot of gold, then you can spend some of that hard-earned cash by exploring and finding some spell shops such as this one in the mines, where you sometimes can acquire some very useful spells. Other than flasks, health, items, spells, gold, and wands, you might also find something very rare. So try going above the cliff. Try going above the tree. Try going in here. Try going in here. And try going in here. There are side biomes all over the place, holding not only great treasure, not only great danger, 
but great knowledge as well. And this is very much the type of game where the more knowledge you have, the better your runs will be on average. And there is a lot to know. But always remember, as you explore, make sure you're always aware of where that exit portal is. And make sure you always have a clear path to it. Because if you get into trouble, and you will, and you get critically injured, there is still a chance that you can survive and save your run. So having a fast and clear path back to safety is pretty important, and has saved many a run. One of the defining gameplay elements of Noita is how the world is seemingly divided into multiple stages, with the Holy Mountain safe zones sandwiched between each of these. Inside which, the player finds a fleeting sanctuary containing full heal, a refresher that replenishes spell charges, a shop containing either wands or spells, as well as a choice of perks and the ability to edit their wands. Apart from this perk, outside of the Holy Mountains, there are precious few ways for the player to do this, making this perk perhaps the greatest in the entire game. Because as soon as you leave the Holy Mountain, not only does the roof collapse, but your ability to edit wands inside of it is also removed. And editing wands is probably the most important ability in the entire game. So not being able to do this continuously forces you further and further into the game, maybe before you're ready to actually do so. So learning how to exit the Holy Mountains without triggering this collapse is also of utmost importance. There are numerous ways to actually cut through the ultra-tough brickwork of the Holy Mountains, but typically doing so will anger the gods, and then you'll have to deal with this guy. I have another entire video just on that subject if you want to go check that out. But for now, let's learn how to exit the Holy Mountains without angering the gods. The exit of the Holy Mountain will detect whether or not a player is attempting to pass. It does not care at all about any other creature. Therefore, the first method is to simply polymorph into anything else before attempting to leave. This will allow you to pass by the trigger without triggering the collapse. Just be extremely careful of any enemies that might be nearby. Then, whenever you want to re-enter the Holy Mountain, just poly again before reaching the top of this wall. It might actually take a lot of practice in order to be able to levitate up high enough to get in here again. So, as another tip, make sure to tap the levitate key or button instead of holding it down. With some practice, this will allow you to levitate higher than normal. The next method involves just using some unstable teleportadium in order to escape. Simply stain yourself with it or drink some to avoid the collapse. However, you can stabilize this unstable teleportadium by mixing it with slime, very easily obtained, at least in the second biome, the coal pits. Because the bad enemies bleed copious amounts of it. Simply mixing these two substances together will convert them into normal teleportadium, which is much more reliable than unstable teleportadium. Then, by keeping your cursor close to yourself, just carefully toss in an empty flask. If that flask just refuses to fill, a good tip is just to go into your mods menu here and then restart with enabled mods active. You don't actually have to use any mods to do this, it's just a restart button, pretty much. Then, as soon as the game restarts, the flask will magically be standing right side up and will promptly fill. But right now on the beta branch of the game, there is a new feature that actually allows alchemic reactions to take place inside the flask. So all you need to do is just have a flask with a little bit of unstable teleportadium in it, and then put some slime in that flask, shake it up a little bit to make the reaction happen faster, and boom, we have teleportadium. Like I said, this is a brand new feature that is still being tested on the beta branch of the game, and so it could possibly change a little bit before being pushed to the main public branch of the game. But at the time of this recording, the community absolutely loves this feature, and so once the bugs are worked out, I'm sure it's here to stay. So if you watch this video months from now, keep in mind that you'll be able to mix potions very easily right inside the flask. And then just aim your cursor in the direction you want to teleport in, either into the Holy Mountain, or even into the previous biome if you would like to re-explore that. The next method involves one of the Teleport Bolt spells, either Normal or Small Teleport Bolt, which is my personal favorite. This one might be a little trickier to pull off, but you basically just want to teleport through this corner right here, because that's where the trigger is. If you get good at this, you'll be able to exit and re-enter Holy Mountains without any problem. 
Just make sure you avoid that corner. If you do have a better form of digging, such as black holes or luminous drills, you can use either of them to actually exit the holy mountain without angering the gods and without triggering the collapse. Simply press your body up against the left wall here and then cut straight upwards. If done correctly, you will not anger the gods. And if you stick to that left wall on your way out and then cut up here, you'll be able to avoid the trigger entirely to avoid the collapse. Now, tinkering with wands might be the main reason why you would want to get back into the Holy Mountain, but is not the only reason. Remember what I said earlier about pacing yourself when learning how to play this game. If you get to a Holy Mountain and you do not yet need the full heal or the spell refresher, you don't have to pick them up. Learning how to conserve your HP and your spell uses so that you can save these two items for later is another very important skill to learn. Because then you could exit the Holy Mountain without angering the gods and without triggering the collapse if you would like, and then explore that next biome until maybe you do need a full heal or a spell refresh. And then you could backtrack and pick those up, which allows you to continue to fully explore that next biome. Like I said, pace yourself. Learn how to conserve your HP, learn how to conserve those consumables. If you do so, you're well on your way to conquering this game. However, that brings us to the next part. There are actually a good number of people who do not like starting with this spell because it's not good for digging. Little do they know that this is probably the best secondary spell to start with. Why? Because every kill with it is a trick kill that awards double gold and does not penalize the player for that creature's demise. Why would you care about not being blamed for a creature's death? Well, that's a secret. However, getting twice the gold for every kill should be reason enough to be excited about starting with this spell, as it very easily allows you to rack up quite a bit of gold in that first mines biome. Especially if you pick your targets and drop one of these mines in a cluster of Hamas or on one of the tougher enemies like the Stendari or Markianen, which will award you with a lot of gold, especially for so early. Well, hold up a second. What is a trick kill? It's simply any kill that is not attributed to the player, which includes enemies dying in any way from the environment itself, as well as certain other techniques such as this spell. Why does this count as a trick kill? Well, because it's basically a mine. It's a trap that you're setting, and the game does not keep track of who laid that trap. Thus, you don't get blamed for the kill. Now, if you're trying to fill out your bestiary with all enemy unlocks in order to get that steam achievement, then you might not want to use this or other techniques that count as trick kills, such as fire, electricity, and whatnot. But if you're not concerned about that enemy unlock, then this is a great spell to start with. If you explore the mines a little bit, then 9 times out of 10, you'll find a better way to dig anyway. So I wouldn't be too concerned about this spell's apparent weakness at digging, because in my opinion, its strengths far outweigh its weaknesses. Anyway, now that I've talked about Unstable Crystal and given you an introduction in what trick kills are, now I need to talk about environmental awareness, i.e. using the environment of the game to your advantage, both offensively and defensively. As you explore, you'll find many explosives, such as these crates and these barrels, that you can employ as makeshift bombs. Not only will they do massive damage to enemies, but you can also use them to destroy the environment and access new paths. Fire is also deadly to not just you, but many enemies in the world as well. It can be very useful in dropping enemy aggro, because once an enemy is set on fire, it forgets all about you in its quest for self-preservation. In the second area, the coal pits, you'll find many of these hanging explosive canisters that you can use as weapons against your enemies, especially useful for crowd control. The third biome, the Snowy Depths, is filled with large chunks of ice and icicles. You can break these structures to cause them to come crashing down on your foes. Again, a very, very effective form of crowd control. So pay attention to your environment as you play, because you can use it to kill your enemies, and these environment kills do cause enemies to drop double gold. That is, without perks. There are actually two trick kill centric perks in the game. Trick Greed, which doubles the amount of gold dropped from trick kills, i.e. enemies will now drop four times the gold as normal when trick killed. And Trick Blood Money, which causes enemies to drop healing gold when they are trick killed. 
other than these positives, there are, of course, very big negatives in not paying attention to your environment. Has this ever happened to you? You're just minding your own business and then an enemy picks up your own discarded wand and kills you with it. Well, to help keep that from happening, when you discard wands, you can actually stick them into the ceiling. And unless an enemy has a reason to jump, they're safe up there. But just to be even safer, you can stick them into ceilings a little bit higher up to make sure that they don't pick them up. Because even though they don't seek out the wand, if they happen to jump and that wand is in their path, they will automatically pick it up. That's just a safe way to dispose of wands so that enemies will not kill you with them, or kill any other creatures you do not want them to kill. Noita is a very chaotic game, so any small amount of control that you can exert over the environment is usually a good thing. Which brings us to this absolute classic way of getting noited. Do not open chests that are submerged in water, as this can very easily happen to you. Instead, what you want to do is shoot that chest with a simple projectile from above. However, if you do not have a projectile that will open chests when shot with it, you have to try to get that chest out of the water. Now, a lot of people don't have the patience for this because it can be a little bit time consuming, but where there's a will, there's a way, and the environment usually helps you out in this regard. If there's any source of fire nearby, then you can use that to lower the water level by evaporating it, which is one of the things that really makes you appreciate just how amazing this game is. Anyway, once the water level is low enough, you can pretty easily kick it out and then open it for your prize. This might seem needlessly tedious to you, but remember that Noita is a game that rewards patience. With patience comes knowledge, and with knowledge comes power. And thus, we at last get to the final part of this video. Wands. I can make an entire video or series of videos or an entire channel just on this subject, such as the complexity of it. But please don't let that discourage you. Wand editing in Noita is extremely enjoyable to experiment with. You might die, but dying is part of the game. To that end, an amazing mod to use that will teach you everything about wand editing without fear of death is the Spell Lab mod. I highly recommend it. But as for this video, let's just cover the basics. What does all this information even mean? Starting from the top, shuffle. If it says no, that means that the wand will fire from the left slot all the way through to the right slot in order every time. Whereas a shuffle yes wand or simply just a shuffle wand means that it's going to pick any slot on that wand at random and fire that one. The casts are not going to go through from left to right. It'll be completely random every time. Non-shuffle wands are obviously much more preferable because it allows you to know exactly what's going to happen every time you fire. And so you can construct very complex wand builds that will perform consistently every shot. The next line, spells per cast, simply tells you how many wand slots are used each time you fire. The majority of wands you find will have one spell per cast, but interestingly, if you find wands that have a forking end, such as these, it actually tells you how many spells per cast that wand is. These are two, and these are three. Cast delay is the amount of time between each spell cast of a wand, whether that be a single spell or a series of spells and modifiers known as a cast block. Keep in mind that other than the wand itself, individual spells also affect cast delay, as do some perks. Which brings us to a way to completely negate that cast delay, using the magical properties of Chainsaw. Let's say you have a wand that fires pretty slowly because it has a large cast delay. On your typical one spell per cast wand, you can just do double cast, projectile, and then chainsaw to end up with a machine gun wand. Placing a chainsaw at the end of a spell block with a large cast delay reduces that entire block's delay to a single frame. It will literally set the cast delay to zero seconds, thus allowing that wand to fire very rapidly. 
as long as it has mana, of course. But on a wand with multiple spells per cast, you don't even need that double spell. The chainsaw spell also drains a very small amount of mana, so you can use it on wands that don't have much. Moreover, it also has a negative recharge time stat, further reducing the time it takes to fire that wand. What is recharge time? Recharge time is the time it takes that wand to fire again after it fires its last spell, whether that be one spell, or 26 spells. The wand takes the higher number between the recharge time or the cast delay and applies that in determining how fast it takes the wand to fire again. So if you have a wand with a fast cast delay, but an absolutely abysmal recharge time, you can sort of cheese this a little bit by firing that wand and then quickly switching to another inventory slot and then back to that wand before it reaches that final spell. Doing this, you can completely skip the recharge time of the wand, as long as you switch to another slot before the wand reaches its final cast, because then you'd have to wait anyway. I figured I'd squeeze one final tip in here for you guys. Mana max is obviously the maximum amount of mana that that wand has. Mana charge speed is how fast that mana recharges. If you have a really slow mana charge speed, you're going to be running out of mana constantly. But remember what I said in part one about concentrated mana. Capacity is obviously the amount of spell slots that that wand has. Although there are extraordinarily rare wands with more slots than this, you can pretty much consider 26 to be the common and maximum. And spread is the accuracy of the wand, whether that be a positive number, i.e. inaccurate, or a negative number. The lower the negative number, the better, because there are spells that add spread. So having a wand with a negative spread will make sure that when you add spells like that to the wand, that number stays below zero and thus retains its accuracy. And finally, there's a completely hidden speed stat on wands that you'll sometimes encounter. This will make some projectiles leave the end of the wand with more force and thus travel faster than normal. And we have finally reached the end of this absolutely gargantuan video. Thank you all so much for watching. I have been working so hard on this video for so long, I really, really hope that a lot of you out there find it very useful. I appreciate all you guys. Thank you again. Have an absolutely amazing day and happy noiting. And as always, if you like what I do and you want to go above and beyond in helping support the channel more than you already do by watching the videos, I have a coffee page where you can leave me a tip. You can support me on Patreon or right here on YouTube as a channel member. And I have a nice selection of t-shirts and hoodies and mugs and mouse mats. If you're interested in any of that stuff, the links are down below in the description. I thank you very, very much. Anyway, have a great day.